This episode is brought to you by Igloo. If you've ever used SharePoint or have an intranet that feels like it was built in the 90s, you know what it means for it to be dull and unengaging. We're going to fix that for you. Sign up at igloosoftware.com slash smart people and use it for free with up to 10 of your favorite coworkers or customers. The podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris and John here, excited to bring you another episode. Make sure if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, head on over to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Sign up for that so we can keep in touch and send you all the cool stuff we're doing, what's coming up. Sometimes we do giveaways. Again, smartpeoplepodcast.com. Check out the posts. We can tell you you know, some of the good quotes going on in these episodes. You can actually go back and look at different posts and just check out the quotes. So excited about our guest today. Today we speak with Stephen Law. Stephen is a professor of philosophy at the University of London, and he wrote a book called Believing Bullshit, How Not to Get Sucked into an Intellectual Black Hole. And when I first stumbled across this book, I must have been at some interesting point in my life uh, fairly recently because it jumped out at me. And the reason is because I think the internet and the headlines and things like BuzzFeed and all these different content creators really just get us to believe a lot of bullshit. Uh, we've gotten good at marketing and jargon, and we know the brain pretty well and how it's going to react to certain things. So I think oftentimes it's exploited. And I wanted to see if we could cover that area a little bit. Uh, what's interesting is Stephen talks about these intellectual black holes, and we're going to cover it more in the interview, but it's basically things in an argument or a discussion that people use to kind of shut down logic, make you believe something, and then once you're there, you don't even realize that's how you got there. Pretty fascinating topic, and even more so, I didn't realize the interesting checkered past that Stephen had. He was actually a mailman for a while out of high school, didn't even go to college, when he realized about his passion for philosophy and turned that into going to uh, an esteemed university, becoming a professor at a great university, writing books, really interesting stuff. I was glad that we kind of covered that. I didn't know it. So we're going to turn it over to Stephen Law. So again, hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, head on over to iTunes, leave us a review. We really appreciate it. If you guys tell us what you think, tell the world what you think. And here is the interview with Stephen Law. All right, Stephen. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Really excited to have you on. And as I was just mentioning to you, your book, Believing Bullshit, really jumped out to me when I when I found it on Amazon for a number of reasons that I want to get into. Primarily, this show being based around curiosity, expanding the mind, learning new things. Uh, I realized there's a lot of these intellectual black holes you talk about that we could easily fall in. And I want to, for my own sake and for our listeners, figure those out. Uh, but before we jump in, I'd like to get a little bit better feel for what you're doing. I know you're a philosophy professor at the University of London, uh, I, and I really was hoping, you know, how'd you get into that? I'm I'm always interested in people who who follow that path because it's uh, not always the clearest path. You don't always know if there's something out there for you, but it's an interesting one. So how'd you become a philosophy professor, an author, an editor, all that stuff? Well, um, I have a, an unusual background, I suppose, for an academic, in that um, I don't have any A-levels, uh, as we call them in the UK, which is the qualification that you're supposed to get before you go to university. It's The, uh, the universities uh, base their acceptance of you on your A-level results, and I don't have any A-levels. I had two goes at um, doing them, and in both, in both cases, um, I left. In fact, the first time I was kicked out and the second time I just left of my own accord and I ended up becoming a postman uh, in Cambridge for a few years. Um, so it didn't look like I was going to have any kind of academic career <laughs> at that point. But then I discovered um, from through reading 
um, I discovered philosophy books. One book led me to another book, and I ended up reading really nothing but philosophy books. I was interested in the big questions, you know, how do I know that this is real and that I'm not living in the matrix? How do I know what's right and wrong? Is there a God? Uh, how do I... How do I know uh, what my mind is? What kind of a thing is the mind? Could a computer or a robot have a mind? All of those questions were very attractive to me. And then I finally discovered that there was this subject philosophy that you could study at university. Uh, and once I discovered that, um, and that you know these are the kind of questions that you got to engage with at university when you studied philosophy, um, then I applied to go to university and by some miracle I actually managed to persuade them to admit me as a, a, mature, a mature student at um, about the age of 24, despite the fact that I didn't have any A-levels. And what exactly does an A-level mean? When you, and when you talk about university, is that an undergrad degree, or I'm trying to follow that path? Yeah, so uh, I applied to do an undergraduate degree um, in philosophy, uh, at the City University of London, and that, that was the only, and some other places, but the City University actually accepted me, despite the fact that I didn't have the usual academic qualification that you obtain at school for entering a university. So mm. I, have a, I have a rather unusual, perhaps rather checkered <laughs> <laughs> academic uh, background. But so, once I was into university, of course, then... Um, you know, I was, that was it. I was hooked. I mean, I love philosophy and I've been doing philosophy ever since. Um, I'm now, I now teach uh, uh, philosophy at university. I'm really interested in that. So when you mention these A-levels, because all I can think about from, from the perspective here in America is you go to high school, you take a few tests and you, you do the song and dance and you can get into some university for the most part. Is that different over there? Yeah, most, most, um, Kids do their GCSEs and then they do their A levels. And their A levels, they might do something like uh, English or biology, you know, a humanities or a, a science subject. They usually do uh, two, three, or four A levels. And then, depending on what results they get for those A levels, universities will um, accept them. And so, some universities are very exclusive, universities set the bar very high. You have to get, you know, three A's or A stars before they will accept you. Um, and other, other, other universities uh, set the bar lower. But not having any A-levels at all, that would normally just preclude you from <laughs> getting into a university. I got um, you. And I don't have any. <laughs> right, right. So this is really interesting. So you, you went to high school, you uh, looked into university, but it didn't work out for you. So you were a postman. And I'm assuming that that's a, like a mailman, right? You, or you're just delivering mail? Yeah, I had a bicycle and a sack, wow. and I put the letters in the sack every morning, and I'd cycle off and uh, deliver them. That's what I did. And at that time, I mean, how did you feel? Because it's so interesting to talk to someone who's now an academic, you know, who's who's really gone through all of it, who's, who's found a subject that they're passionate about and, and learned as much as they can, coming from a, you know, what we would call, I don't know if you guys use the same terminology, but a blue collar job doesn't require education, probably doesn't pay too much. Um, that's a that's a big jump, and it kind of just goes to show that if you find what you really want to do, oftentimes you'll make it happen. Is that a summation of how you felt? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was lucky. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> um, but um, yes, uh, you know, if you discover something that you're passionate about and that you love doing, and you realize you have some talent for it, then um, just because you know you don't have the usual background, I don't think that should put you off. Not at all. Uh, you should go for it. And do you think, because we hear that reading is such a key element in that in that discovery and learning phase. Obviously, we interview primarily authors. I love reading. I'm a big proponent of that mentality. But do you find that that is kind of what propelled you into be able to go to university? You said, I'm going to learn so much about this prior to that despite my lack of the A-levels or formal path, uh, I'm just as knowledgeable and have every right to be there. Yeah, certainly reading had a lot to do with it. I think that the problem I had with um, A-level was that I felt that I was simply going through the motions, you know, jumping through the hoops, that I wasn't really being encouraged to think and question. I was just being, ex I was expected to simply memorize and regurgitate information for exam 
purposes. And that didn't really strike me, even at the time, as being uh, much of an education. I, you know, it was boring. I wasn't interested. Um, there were a lot of questions that occurred to me while I was stu studying those subjects, but um, they weren't really questions that the teachers were, you know, interested in talking about or addressing. And um, I suppose in, in retrospect, I now realise they were really philosophical <laughs> questions. And uh, that was, it was philosophy that I was really interested in. I just didn't realise it um, at the time. I mean, the thing about philosophy is that you really tend to be pressing hard on certain things that otherwise tend to get taken for granted, uh, particularly in other disciplines. So, you know, you're really digging down to the, to the foundations and, you know, sometimes that gets in the way of doing other things. Um, but it can be very fruitful. Um, you know, some of the greatest um, scientific developments have come about through people really just thinking uh, philosophically. And so, it's a good thing to do, but, you know, when it comes to preparing for your A-levels, <laughs> it turns out it wasn't really, wasn't so useful. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of philosophy, and I feel like oftentimes it gets overlooked. It's not a, you're not a, it's not an engineer or a lawyer or doctor, so sometimes people don't as readily point to the benefits of of that subject, and I think that's a problem. And, and I, I mean, personally, I wish I would have done philosophy or psychology in college, but I almost had this too much of a, well, it doesn't really set me up for a future, so why, why do that? And I mean, it's yeah. a horrible mentality now. I, I really, if I could go back, that's what I would do. But yeah. uh, I think that's often propagated by society and, and what it says about those types of majors and you know, professions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that if you if you if you're passionate about philosophy, then you should do philosophy. But it, but even if you want to do a little kind of calculation about you know what's going to help me in my career, um, you should know that actually philosophy uh, is very useful. I mean, I'm not saying that's the only reason for doing it, or even that it should be the main use reason for doing it. But if, for example, you look at the graduate record exam results of students across uh, 50 degree subjects, um, which degree programs produce the students who have the best kind of all-round intellectual skills that are doing best on the GRE exam with its three components of um, uh, uh, reasoning, uh, language and maths? Consistently, philosophy comes top um, on those scores along with physics. Physics and philosophy rule the GRE. Um, so people often think, well, I shouldn't do a degree in philosophy. I should do something useful like, say, business administration. That's going to get me a career. Look at the GRE scores of the people that are doing business administration. Uh, they are some of the lowest scores amongst um, those 50 degree programs. So you should be aware that what those career orientated degrees churn out very often and not particularly bright or able individuals. The thing about philosophers is they have good all round smarts. They're very good at spotting the flaws in an argument, at um, cutting through the BS, um, at putting together, putting the point together uh, with clarity and precision and so on. And those are skills that you're going to find pretty useful in a, across a wide range of careers. And in fact, you very often find that it's recommended that people do, for example, philosophy uh, before they pursue law uh, as a career. It gives them a really solid uh, set of skills on which they can draw when they move on to do something like law. So for goodness sake, don't make the mistake of thinking that philosophy is a head in the clouds discipline and thus a complete waste of time so far as um, your education is, is concerned. Actually, in, in many ways, it's one of the most useful degree programs that you could choose. Yeah, you know, I, I really agree with you on that for a number of reasons. I mean, primarily, the working environment has changed so much. And I even I've seen it in the decade that I've been working in some capacity is, you know, People need to be able to think critically, solve critical problems, be uh, creative. It's not really a cog in a machine for the most part anymore, and especially a lot of those good jobs that people want to get. And it's going to benefit the person that can, quote unquote, think outside the box, can can really get their point across in a way that makes sense, is poignant, is is concise. So I completely agree with that. And I hope that as the this new generation, I, I guess I would consider almost my generation, 
becomes bosses and is doing some of the hiring, uh, we will encourage people to take up those humanities because I think we're a little less old school in, well, if they didn't get a business degree, I can't teach them business. I, I don't, I, I personally don't believe in it and the people that I interact with don't. So I think it's just maybe going to be a slightly slower shift, but I think it's coming. Yeah, well, let's hope so. It's certainly true that uh, philosophy graduates are amongst the most able graduates. Uh, and that's been, you know, you know, look at the stats, you can see it. Um, and so, you know, no one should be uh, turning away uh, philosophy graduates. In fact, they should be actively seeking them out. You know, and the last question I had for you was, what was it about philosophy that, that really got you fired up? What Was there a subject or when you found it? And, and the reason I ask is this. A lot of times people hear, hey, you know, follow your passion and you'll make it happen. And what I hesitate to or, or what I want to make sure we cover is that you didn't know that this was your passion until you're in your early 20s, a time when people oftentimes are, are already working at a job that they feel like could be their career. So what was that spark or trigger and the fact that you can find it even after college and into your into adulthood? I'm not sure. There wasn't a eureka moment, really. It was just a gradual dawning on me that this was <laughs> uh, really what I wanted to do. I had always been drawn to these kind of questions. You know, I found them exciting. I wanted to talk to my parents about them and other people. And I, I, sought, I sought books that would uh, inform me uh, about them. Um, and, it, you know, the more I did, the more I wanted to do. And it gradually kind of became an addiction, I suppose. It's not for, it's, you know, not everyone likes it. Not everyone's interested in philosophical questions. I suppose one of the things that attracts me to it is it's kind of thinking on the edge. You know, it's... Um, it's kind of going right to the edge of the envelope. It's it's pressing up against the very limits of what we know or can know and asking very fundamental questions. And often uh, that can be kind of scary. Not everyone is going to enjoy that as an experience. I also like mountaineering, um, uh, rock climbing, and I go climbing in the Alps sometimes. And uh, it's kind of an activity that you know gives you an adrenaline rush, and it's exciting, and there's a kind of a you know you experience the vertigo. Well, uh, Wittgenstein is a philosopher. He famously talked about intellectual vertigo, and that's very often what you get when you start doing philosophy. You realise that the things that you've just been taking for granted unreflectively, when you start thinking about them, it's as if someone suddenly pulled the rug out from underneath you, and you're you know you're you're hanging there over a void and some people they just don't want that experience <laughs> they want to stay where they feel safe but for other people uh it's kind of um you know it's invigorating it's exciting it's uh it's fascinating to be pressing these questions and trying to you know grapple with them and figure out as best we can what the answers are absolutely well let's turn our attention to grappling with some of these questions and Talk a little bit about your book that caught me, you know, caught me off guard. I love the title and I, I kind of I love the premise. I think there's too much bullshit in the world. So um, believing bullshit, how not to get sucked into an intellectual black hole. First, I guess I'd like to ask, what is an intellectual black hole? Well, it's I'm, I'm making an analogy, obviously, with sure. black, black holes in space. So, you know, a black hole in space is a, a, a gravitationally very powerful object, massive object, if you get too close, you pass the event horizon, you're, you're sucked in, uh, never to escape. And it seems to me that there are belief systems in our cultural environment that function in a similar kind of way. You know, you're walking down the high street and some wide-eyed true believer presses a leaflet into your hand and says, you know, have you heard the good news or the truth or whatever it may be about this, that or the other thing? And before you know it, you're having a conversation with them and they're beginning to draw you in. And it seems to me that we should all have some awareness of the warning signs so far as intellectual black holes are concerned. Intellectual black holes are belief systems put together in such a way that they turn people into intellectual prisoners. They trap people inside rarely, if ever, to escape. And um, the way they work is they shut down your ability to think clearly and rigorously. You might think you're doing that. You might think, I mean, usually the people inside an intellectual black hole think that they're the ones that really know and everyone else is deluded. But the truth is that the, the black hole has kind of 
imprisoned them mentally and got them to shut down or disable their intellectual powers. And that's how they become uh, victims. And it seems to me that young people in particular ought to have some knowledge of the warning signs of an intellectual black hole. So, you know, when they're surfing the internet or walking down the high street and somebody comes up to them and starts sucking them in, that they they know the warning signs. A little red light's going to come on in their head and think, hey, now, hang on a minute, what's really going on here? Yeah, and you know, one of the things I love about your book is you talk about how it's not just the gullible or the poorly educated, but some of the world's greatest thinkers have fallen in. Uh, you can be intelligent, educated, and I'd imagine those are the people that it's actually a little more scary. I mean, nobody wants to admit or believe that they're not thinking critically and objectively about an issue, yet you argue that it happens. So I was wondering, for those people that are in it and can't see it, you know, what would you tell them? Because we're gonna, I want to get into what some examples of those. But before we do that, I want to see, you know, if you're in it now, here are some ways you might figure that out. You want some warning signs. <laughs> how, do I know, how do I know whether I myself have fallen victim to one? Because yeah. as you correctly point out, um, you know, you don't have to be a fool to fall into one of these things to become a victim. I mean, some very smart, well-educated people have ended up believing some pretty ridiculous things. Uh, one of my favorite examples is um, Arthur Conan Doyle, who, of course, invented the world, you know, the quintessentially rational fictional detective uh, Sherlock Holmes. Now, Arthur Conan Doyle believed in fairies, and he, uh, he really did believe in fairies. And in fact, he was successfully hoaxed by two little girls armed with a little black and white film character um, camera who told their parents and everyone else that uh, they'd been photographing fairies down in the woods. And the photographs were pretty pretty convincing looking photographs and they, they ended up convincing Arthur Conan Doyle that uh, in fact they really had seen the fairies. Um, it just goes to show, you know, this is a remarkably knowledgeable, sophisticated and educated person who ends up being sucked into an intellectual black hole. Um, another thing to remember is that um, very often, I mean, there's now evidence to suggest that actually being smart and well-educated uh, is no, gives you no, very little immunity so far as um, intellectual black holes are concerned. What smart, well-educated people are very good at doing is cooking up rationalizations for continuing to believe what they already believe, even when the evidence suggests that they're wrong. So, you know, being smart, and well-educated, by no means is that going to provide you with any kind of immunity to intellectual black holes. What you really need to know is what are the warning signs. We'll be right back to this interview after a quick word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Igloo. Igloo is a web-based platform for collaborating at work. You know we need to be in touch with all our coworkers today. We need to pass along information smoothly, efficiently, and we got to do it quick. And that's what Igloo does. Igloo is an intranet you'll actually like. It's built with easy-to-use integrated apps like file sharing, blogs, shared calendars, task management, and much more. So you can work better together, co-authoring documents, sharing status updates, managing your projects, all in one place. Plus, you don't have to be a certified web guy to set up or use Igloo. Everything is widget-based, and it's drag-and-drop. Igloo helps provide an opportunity to improve knowledge sharing and showcase the smart people within your company and encourage continuous learning. Try out Igloo for free with up to 10 of your favorite coworkers if you go to our special link, which is igloosoftware.com slash smart people. Again, sign up at igloosoftware.com slash smart people and use it for free with up to 10 coworkers. I have two questions there, but uh, I guess we'll go into it because it makes natural, you know, it's a natural flow here. What are some of those warning signs? Well, one warning sign is when people start to appeal to mystery to get themselves out of trouble. They start playing the mystery card. When you, there are certain phrases that you want to watch out for. When people start saying things like, they start quoting Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and hell than are dreamt of in your philosophy, a uh, little red light should be coming on uh, at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, because, of course, there are things that we don't understand. Of course, we should show some humility and acknowledge that, um, you know, science can only take us so far and that there may be questions, I think there are questions that science can't answer. 
But um, that's not to say that science hasn't perhaps established that certain things are not true. So, for, I mean, a nice example would be um, science has established that the entire universe is a bit older than 6,000 years, for example. Um, and science has established um, perhaps that certain alternative medicines don't work. You know, they've been tested, they don't work. Uh, science, interesting scientific ex um, experiments were done on the the effect of holding a crystal while meditating um, by a colleague of mine. Because it's often claimed that crystals have an interesting effect on your psyche. If you hold the crystal and if you meditate while holding the crystal, interesting things will happen to your psyche as, you, as a result of your holding onto that crystal. So what uh, a scientific colleague of mine did was he, div he took a, a group of people and he divided them into two randomly and he gave one group real crystals and the other group fake crystals. And he asked them to meditate holding these crystals. They didn't know whether they had a real one or a fake one. And then he got them to report on the interesting psychological episodes that they had while, uh, while doing this. And they just reported exactly the same thing. That whether or not they were holding a real crystal or a fake crystal, it had no effect. Mm. Um, and that very strongly suggests that the effect of crystals on people's psyche is largely down to the power of suggestion. It's really got nothing whatsoever to do with the crystals themselves. So there's a Good, good looking bit of scientific evidence against the theory that crystals have this interesting effect. Now, of course, when you point that out to people, immediately people start playing the mystery card. Immediately a smoke screen of mystery is erected in order to try and protect the belief in the efficacy of crystals. Um, people will start saying, oh, there are more things in heaven and earth than the dreams of in your philosophy. And uh, the mere absence of evidence is not ev evidence of absence and so on. I love that because even as you were saying it, not that I believe it, but I wanted to ask, well, it, doesn't that just assume we know everything? If we leave no room for the unknown, what you're calling mystery, then we're kind of deciding we've we figured it all out and i think the what the thing you argue is no it's not that we figured everything out but you can't just bring that up as a fact as a as a method to prove against current logic yeah it's it's not on to use mystery as a kind of get out of jail free card which is very often what happens so let me admit you know there are plenty of things that are mysterious. I don't know the answers to certain fundamental questions. You know, where did the universe come from? I don't know. Uh, I have some ideas, but it is a really deep and mysterious thing. Um, but just because I can't answer a question, just, you know, I'm acknowledging there's a mystery here. I'm showing some humility. It doesn't follow that, you know, we can't reasonably rule out certain answers. Um, I think people often want to draw a veil across reality and say, Science and reason can go up to the veil. Uh, they, it can, it can uh, tell us about, inform us about the world that we see around us. But there's a hidden dimension. There's that which is beyond. And what is beyond perhaps contains um, supernatural phenomena, our, our dead relatives, gods and fairies and so on. And the suggestion is that science and reason cannot touch these things. They're immune. They're behind the veil. Um, but perhaps some special people with special powers can glimpse through the veil and perhaps communicate with those on the other side and, and so on. Now, I'm more than happy to admit that there may be things back there that are beyond our understanding that we'll never really get to know about. But it doesn't follow from that, that the that you know any any claim about uh, gods or angels or fairies or the healing powers of crystals or the efficacy of petitionary prayer that these claims can't be investigated even scientifically and of course sometimes they are and I've just given you an example um, crystals were scientifically investigated to see if they really did have an effect on people's psyches and turns out they don't uh, the evidence uh, very strongly suggests that they don't have the effect that that's claimed and unfortunately when when you point that out people play the mystery card in order to try and get themselves out of trouble but they're really uh, not not justified in playing the card at that particular point so let's acknowledge that you know there's much that we don't know and let's acknowledge that science has its limits it doesn't follow from that that uh, very many of these claims can't actually be rationally and empirically investigated and in some cases shown to be false.
Right, right. And what you mentioned earlier about the fact that even for the intellectuals, it's it becomes very easy to rationalize your own thoughts, your own opinion. We've talked to a lot of psychologists and philosophers on the show, and there's a lot of names behind these types of biases, but it's really just our ability to – oftentimes the decisions we make are made in our subconscious, and we only use our conscious to give us – you know, the reasons behind why we made those decisions, whether right or wrong. And so I think that really plays a key role into what you're saying about being stuck in these fly traps or these black holes, uh, because if somebody is able to convince us of something, we will tell ourselves we're right because we don't want to feel uh, inferior. Yes, it's it's an uncomfortable experience to have some, you know, one of your fundamental beliefs challenged. And um, you can usually defend your belief by... Um, various maneuvers um, and in fact of uh, the warning signs of an intellectual black hole that I list in the book um, well, one of them I call but it fits which is um, the art of making your belief system consistent or fit with the evidence people are remarkably good at that they're remarkably good at explaining away any evidence that might seem to suggest that they're wrong and they're very good at seizing on anything that might seem to support what they believe Unfortunately, we, we all tend to do that to some extent, and we all need to be on our guard against it. I mean, that's, that's obviously that's, that's known as confirmation bias, and we are all prone to it. And, of course, there are some interesting psychological theories um, about confirmation bias. It sounds like you've had some people on talking about them. Yeah, and there was actually – there's one that you mentioned in your book called Piling Up the Anecdotes. And I was hoping we could talk about that because I know that a lot of people we speak with on the show – use anecdotes as a way to explain their area of expertise, the things that they just know. And I think there's a lot of, there's some good use for that. But when you cover it, I really like the way you bring in that, the skepticism and looking at it from a different angle. Yes, anecdotal evidence. Um, if you're relying very heavily on anecdotal evidence, uh, that is, again, that's one of the warning signs of an intellectual black hole, belief systems that tend to appeal to anecdotal evidence a lot. Um, so anecdotal evidence is, uh, an example would be, um, uh, well, maybe you, maybe you believe that some people um, have psychic powers, and in order to support that belief, you might say, well, look, um, I, 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 I was just thinking about my auntie, and the phone rang, and it was her at the end of the line. Amazing. Uh, that, that's a piece of evidence that I have psychic powers. Um, and then you could pull together various other examples and you start gluing these things together and you begin to convince yourself that you're really making a case for the, uh, for the existence of psychic powers. But the fact is that this evidence actually is very poor evidence for your having psychic powers. But it's psychologically very powerful. One of the things about these kind of stories that we tell each other um, is that Although they're pretty poor evidence, they really are persuasive very often. They have great psychological clout. And if you, if you feed people a series of anecdotes, um, you can often uh, get them to believe something that they really ought not to believe. Um, the anecdote uh, trumps the dry statistic uh, every time. The, the statistic may suggest there's nothing to this. You know the experiment that's done may show no, they really are, they really aren't psychic powers. But if you if you if you just keep feeding people the anecdotes, um, you'll find that very often they will believe. One of the reasons why I was so fascinated by this is because I really think that with the amount of information out there and the internet, which is great, I'm not at all saying you know th that this is a bad thing, but it's it's hard to discern right from wrong or up from down sometimes. Uh, who's telling the truth, who's not. And people, the more I get into content creation and uh, trying to, to get information out there that people want, uh, I personally struggle with the fact that I don't want to, I don't want to say pander, but I, I don't want to just write what people want to read, what's going to get the most uh, page views. I don't want to write the titles that just suck you in. I just find that really disingenuous, but it's everywhere and it works. And so, you know, for for people out there, as you mentioned, the younger generation specifically that are uh, going around the Internet and they're really soaking it all up. They love this information. 
for these, you know, without having to go into all of your um, the the black holes, because I want people to read your book. But what are some things that might jump out in written word that people can go, oh, wait a second, or maybe it's in headlines or titles or, or things like that that you just can you see in the internet or on- online or in these uh, articles that that people can kind of point out as a quick red flag. Well, if somebody's peddling some kind of cure, for example, um, look out for testimonials uh, because they are anecdotal evidence. Um, so, for example, uh, no one no one does uh, bloodletting anymore, uh, but for a very long time, uh, for hundreds, indeed thousands of years, it was thought that the way to make people better was in very often to open up uh, you know, a, a, an artery and let, let a pint of blood out. Um, and uh, that was practiced up until, you know, just uh, 150, 200 years ago. It was considered to work. Why did people think that it worked? Well, testimonials. Um, you, you, people were bled and they got better. Uh, uh, that happened over and over and over again. And so a vast store of anecdotes was built up, which seemed to suggest that bloodletting worked but the fact is of course that you know people are going to get better anyway i mean when people get coughs and colds and various other illnesses they do get better and so the mere fact that people were getting better after having been being bled wasn't really very good evidence that the bloodletting was what was making them better it was um and of course no one bothered recording all of the occasions on which people were bled and then subsequently died (laughs) uh that wasn't recorded so the problem is that if you just amass all of these anecdotes in that kind of way, these testimonials, and then list them off. It can look very persuasive. Um, But the truth is that until you actually do a proper experiment, say, with bloodletting, actually divide the group of people into two randomly, and then some get bloodlet and some don't, and see whether there's actually any real effect. It's not until you do that that you find out whether it works or not. And when that was done, it turned out it doesn't work, you know. The experiment established conclusively bloodletting does not work. And yet for hundreds, indeed thousands of years, people were absolutely convinced that it did work because of the testimonials, because of the anecdotal evidence. So always watch out for those testimonials. Um, I'm not saying that if a testimonial is there on an advert that that means it's all baloney, but you should place very little uh, trust in those kind of testimonials. It's, uh, It's something to be wary of. Yeah, and I think as you mentioned, it's that's especially important when it comes to cures or weight loss or supplements or homeopathic treatments. Uh, just because, as you mentioned, who knows? There's so much out there. It could be the fact that they want to believe that and they got better. It could be the fact that a small percentage is always going to benefit, just given the changes in their life. I mean, there's so many things out there, and that's one of the things the inter- internet's meant to sell. So I think. Uh, that's a place where we find a lot of that BS. Exactly. So, you know, ane- anecdotes are things that you need to be careful of. I mean, partly, if we've already touched on one of the reasons, is that, you know, just by chance these things are going to happen anyway, and it doesn't establish that there's any kind of causal connection between bloodletting and getting better. If you can point to a list of examples of people who were underwent bloodletting and then got better, that's not good evidence. Um, but uh, you also have to remember that very often people can't be trusted. They make stuff up or... Or they delude themselves. They convince themselves that something is happening when really it is not. Or they convince themselves that they've witnessed something when really um, they have not. Um, one of my, my favorite examples of that, actually, is um, flying saucers. The very first flying saucer report was uh, made by a pilot called Kenneth Arnold way back, I think it was in 1947. And he... Uh, recorded sources, uh, sorry, reported sources to the media and the media reported sources. And lo and behold, after that, everyone started seeing sources and we've been seeing them ever since and they appear in films and so on. But the interesting thing about um, the original flying saucer story is that actually Arnold didn't say that he saw sources. He said he saw boomerang shaped craft, which bounced up and down like a saucer skipping across a lake you know like when you skip stones across a lake they bounce up and down so it turns out (laughs) that the original report was not of a saucer-shaped object and yet after that everyone started seeing saucer-shaped objects why do people see saucer-shaped objects because that's what they expect to see Uh, we're remarkably good at seeing stuff 
that isn't there or misinterpreting things. So the power of suggestion and another, another thing that needs to be taken into consideration when we're considering that kind of anecdotal evidence. The power of suggestion. I love that one. I was just listening to an interview with Cal Newport, and he talks about how Steve Jobs is often misquoted from his 2005 commencement speech at Stanford. He says, you should do something you love. Don't don't settle for work you don't love. And people interpreted that as follow your passion. And we know that's not what he meant. This is what Cal goes on to talk about. There's an interview with Steve Jobs biographer, Walter Isaacson, in which Walter asks Steve specifically about this advice on following your passion. And Steve says, it's not all about you and your damn passion. You need to get out there and make a dent in the universe. And I think it's just another example of how through the telephone game, you can pick out something that sounds nice, put it in a little soundbite, throw it out to the world and people will eat it up. But really, not only was it not the intention of the person who said it, but it could be harmful. And especially as it kind of permeates through the minds of individuals, uh, if it's not even the truth for somebody as successful as Steve Jobs. Yeah, there's another nice example of people hear what they want to hear, what they expect to hear. Um there are so many examples like that. Um, I, I'm particularly keen on the UFO flying saucer ones. Another another one I really like is, um, I've forgotten when it was, but uh, a little bit later on, after the Arnold sighting, there was a sighting of a strange object over a nuclear power plant site. A power plant was being built. And uh, the people working at the site reported this strange object. And then police showed up and they saw the strange object and they were blown away by it. Um, uh, um, a magistrate showed up and he was he thought this was extraordinary too and they described the object in some detail a large flaming object at least the size of a football field they described it as um, and then some reporters showed up and they looked at it and they were again struck by it and they attempted to pursue it in their car and they pursued it for some time eventually they got out of the car because they couldn't get any closer to it they looked at it through a long lens and it was the planet Venus uh, these guys have been looking at the planet Venus for several nights and become, they've become more and more worked up about what it was that they were witnessing. Uh, they were all feeding off each other's descriptions of it. It was just the planet Venus. And yet here we're dealing with a magistrate, the chief of police, uh, security guards, all providing this seemingly independent testimony that something extraordinary existed when very, you know, at the end of the day, it really didn't. So just because, you know, you have lots of witnesses claiming that they've seen something extraordinary, again, anecdotal evidence, be very, very careful about accepting it, uh, just taking it at face value. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. I really appreciate all this. Again, Believing Bullshit, How Not to Get Sucked Into an Intellectual Black Hole. We will link to that on smartpeoplepodcast.com. Uh, where else, is there anywhere else you write or where people can find you? I mean, I know with philosophy, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. So I'm sure people would like to kind of learn more about your stance on a lot of issues. Uh, well, I have a blog at www.stephenlaw.org, Stephen with a P-H. And I'm also now doing blog, I'm blogging for uh, Center for Inquiry uh, in the United States as well. Um, so if you want to read blog entries, you can go to one of those two sites, Center for Inquiry or stephenlaw.org. And there are also a lot of um, videos and podcasts of me now on the Internet. So, for example, there's a long conversation between me and Richard Dawkins talking about science and reason, uh, which you can find fairly easily. And there's a debate between me and William Lane Craig. A uh, famous Christian evangelist on the existence of God. Again, you can find that easily on uh, on YouTube. So yeah, if you if you want to hear a bit more about what I have to think about these topics, it's not hard to find it. Fantastic. Well, again, Stephen, thank you so much for being on the show. Appreciate you taking the time out. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Stephen. Hopefully, that talk there will help you stop and think when looking at all the BS that is out there. I know for myself, I get caught up in all kinds of different Reddit and BuzzFeed articles, but hopefully thinking the way that Steven thinks will make me realize, okay, who's trying to sell me something here or who's telling me something that's not scientifically backed. If you enjoyed this episode or any other episode of Smart People Podcast, please head over to iTunes and Stitcher and leave a rating and comment there. It helps us bring amazing guests onto the show, and we really do like to see 
what you guys think about the show, you know, what we're doing well, what we can improve on, any of that helps. And if you'd like to reach out to us, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or send us a message on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. Chris and I are pretty good at getting back to people on that. So if you want to have some type of conversation, just reach out. As we've mentioned before, we do have laptop stickers available. So if you want one of those for your computer or wherever in your house, shoot us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com and we will send you a couple of those your way. All right, guys, have a great week and stay tuned to all things Smart People Podcast and we will see you next week. Next week.